The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Our next presenter, you may be familiar with her uh, since she has received much media attention as principal investigator of NASA's Nuclear Spectroscopic Telescope Array, or NUSTAR, which is the first high energy X ray telescope. It uses mirrors and detectors that her team developed to focus high energy X rays into the universe and generate images that are more detailed than any that, we've been, that have been seen in this part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Her successful mission, New Star, will be able to find black holes even when they're hidden behind the dust and gas of the universe. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce the professor of physics and astronomy in the division of physics, mathematics, and astronomy, Dr. Fiona Harrison. astrophysics mission, uh, New Star, which, uh, as we just heard, was developed here at Caltech and uh, with JPL and partners around the world. And New Star is a, a NASA small explorer mission. So this is NASA's smallest astrophysics platform. And New Star, on this small platform, will be the very first focusing high energy X ray telescope. And as such, it will make images that are 10 times crisper and 100 times more sensitive than any uh, experiment we've had in this part of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum before. And what makes this possible is a combination of hard work, but also, uh, importantly, new technologies that were developed over the last decade and then incorporating uh, these new technologies onto uh, this platform. So what I'm going to tell you about today is I'm going to try to start by explaining why we want to study the universe in high energy x-rays. What is it that high energy x-rays uniquely can tell us? And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the technologies, uh, how x-ray telescopes work, what we had to do to make them work at higher energies, and how we managed to squish this whole enormous school bus sized telescope into a small rocket and launch it. And then I'm going to finish uh, by telling you what New Star's been looking at. We just started our science program August 1st, so this is very fresh, hot off the press. In fact, some of these images you will be the first ones to see outside my team. Uh, and I'll tell you then what we hope to learn. So let me just remind you, X-rays are electromagnetic radiation. Astronomers primarily study uh, the universe in electromagnetic radiation. And it never ceases to amaze me that this is the same phenomena, alternating electric and magnetic fields, uh, in radio waves, microwaves, infrared, X-rays and gamma rays, all electromagnetic radiation. Now, quantum mechanics, if you remember back to the equivalent of is 2 or 12 or whatever it was uh, when you were here, we know uh, we have to think about it paradoxically both like a wave and like particles. Okay? Now, because, uh, and, uh, because of this, in the X-ray band, we talk about counting individual X-rays, okay, quanta particles, and we talk about measuring their energy. All right? So energy and the wavelength are related. Uh, the wavelength just being the distance uh, between peaks and troughs. And we divide the X-ray band somewhat arbitrarily into low energy X-rays and high energy X-rays. And that you can see on the very right there. Uh, the dividing line is 10 kilo electron volts. Don't worry too much about uh, that unit of energy. But just remember, the dividing line uh, experimentally is around 10 kilo electron volts. And we've had very sensitive astronomical telescopes that work below 10 kilo electron volts, and basically none that work above 10 kilo electron volts. So this is sort of another view of the same thing. And what I want to try to get across here is, is what is it uniquely that we learn by studying high energy x-rays? So uh, let me remind you that uh, the temperature of a body determines what uh, wavelength or energy of uh, electromagnetic uh, radiation it will emit. So things that are really cold, like the early universe, emit in the radio and microwave. Things that are really hot, 10,000 times uh, the temperature 
of the sun will radiate primarily in the X-ray and high-energy X-ray. So by studying the universe in high-energy X-rays, we can study some of the hottest, most energetic phenomena in the universe. So high-energy X-rays are also emitted from regions where particles are accelerated within a, a fraction of a percent of the speed of light. So these very energetic regions, and also some of the uh, extreme, uh, the most dense regions in the universe. So uh, we want to extend sensitive telescopes to high energies so that we can uh, study these phenomena. Another thing about high energy x-rays, so this is the same energy of x-ray that your doctor uh, uses to take uh, x-rays of your bone, so to penetrate through your skin, all right, and view uh, the bones underneath, or your dentist, uh, these are about 60 kilo electron volts, and this is the same band uh, or energy range that New Star operates in. So just like high energy x-rays uh, penetrate through the skin and allow us to view bones, we can use these high energy x-rays emitted from astrophysical objects to view them even if they're hidden behind uh, large amounts of dust and gas. So we can sort of x-ray through all the stuff in galaxies and get to energetic phenomena like black holes uh, that exist uh, at their heart. So it's both the ability to study very energetic phenomena and uh, to view these phenomena, even if hidden uh, deep behind uh, dust and gas. So, oops. I mean, well, I'll start it uh, uh, over again. <laughs> I was not supposed to start until I click. Sorry about that. Uh, so, I'm going to talk about a lot about black holes, because black holes are one of the primary phenomena that uh, New Star aims to study. Now, uh, how do we see black holes? After all, black holes are so compact, their gravity is so strong, uh, that when you're close to the black hole, uh, no light can escape. So we're not actually seeing the black holes themselves. What New Star aims to do is find black holes by viewing the material, the matter, that is attracted to the black hole by its gravity, falls on uh, and heats up. And so this next animation I'm going to show you uh, shows you a galaxy. And at the heart of this galaxy is a very massive black hole. In fact, at the heart of almost every galaxy, there's a massive black hole. All the dust and the gas in the galaxy get attracted by gravity. In, when you get close to the black hole, this material arranges itself into a disk, and friction in this disk heats that material up uh, to temperatures so high that it radiates in the high-energy X-ray. And in addition, through this process, particles in these central regions, okay, just a few times the, event, the size of the event horizon, uh, these particles get accelerated very close to the speed of light, and this uh, emits even more high-energy X-ray radiation. So if we look at the sky, if you point an optical telescope up at the sky, mostly what you're going to see is galaxies. All right, This is a beautiful Hubble uh, image. It's the Hubble Deep Field. Right? And, if, and this is just pointing Hubble uh, into the sky, and most you know, 90% of these objects are, are galaxies. If you point an X-ray telescope, even a low-energy X-ray telescope, up at the same region of sky, you're not going to see the starlight. You're not going to see the galaxies. What you're going to see is the radiation from this material that's falling into the black holes. And you're seeing this very hot uh, gas uh, right before it disappears uh, forever onto the black hole. So we can think of galaxies as having uh, two important constituents, the, the stars uh, that shine and the black holes that reside at their centers. 
And these black holes grow over time. From the time of their formation, dust and gas falls onto these black holes uh, from the galaxy. The black holes grow bigger and bigger. And uh, this is a process that occurs uh, throughout the age of the universe. So, so if we can detect them in low energy x-rays, why bother to extend our reach to the high energy x-ray band? Well, the reason is that in many cases, uh, these black holes are hidden behind dust and gas. It's co it exists in copious amounts in galaxies. And this dust and gas absorbs the low energy x-rays. It also, by the way, absorbs optical light. And uh, if we want to view the black holes, study them, and understand uh, how they radiate, we have to look uh, at high energy x-rays. So in uh, the energy band where the New Star Telescope operates. OK, so at this point, you're probably thinking, OK, you can find black holes. That sounds kind of cool, but why is it important in the bigger picture? Well, there's a number of amazing facts we've learned over the last 10 or 15 years. Right? Amazing fact number one is that every galaxy like our Milky Way has a massive black hole at its heart. It used to be thought that black holes were sort of exotic and rare. All right? But every galaxy has one. We know that now. And the other thing we know is that there's a relationship between the galaxy and the black hole. And this relationship is that uh, if you take uh, the bulge part or the spherical part of a galaxy and ask how mu much mass is there, it turns out to be about a thousand times the mass of the black hole that's at the center of the galaxy. And this relationship, so if you look at this plot, all right, you don't have to worry about the units on the axis, all right, except that on the x-axis there, that's a measure of the galaxy mass, and on the y-axis is a measure of the mass of the black hole at the center of the galaxy. And you can see there's a relationship. Now, why is that uh, surprising? Well, I should also say there's another interesting relationship, and that's if you sort of look on average, the rate at which, ga which galaxies are forming stars is related to the rate at which their central black holes are growing, okay, or accreting matter and growing by about the same ratio, about 1,000. 1,000 times more stars are formed on average than uh, uh, that rate is about 1,000 times the rate the black hole is growing. So why is this surprising? Well, it's surprising because if you think about how much of a galaxy a black hole can influence gravitationally, it's a tiny fraction, all right? Because you know, once you get out to a radius where the amount of matter inside that radius is, uh, so if you count up all, all the mass from stars and black holes and other things, where the stars dominate, the black hole doesn't have any influence anymore. It, its gravity doesn't have any influence. And that's a small region. It's about, uh, for our black hole at the center of our galaxy, which is about four million times the mass of the sun, uh, it's about one fifty thousandth uh, of the distance between Earth and the center of the galaxy. That's about the volume over which the black hole can have influence. So how is it possible then that somehow uh, we're getting this relationship between the properties of the whole big galaxy and the black holes? Well, it's believed, well, I should say first, this is one of the biggest outstanding problems in modern uh, astrophysics, is how this happens. And it's believed that it's in the process of formation of the galaxies that the black holes have influence, that as galaxies merge and form bigger galaxies, their black holes merge and can, over short periods of time, emit large amounts of energy. And by pumping energy out into the galaxy, uh, it influences the uh, entire galaxy. It can sh choke off the formation of future stars. And this process we call feedback. It's not very well understood. But we think that uh, there is some 
coupling, well, there must be some coupling between how the black holes grow and how the galaxies grow. So if we want to understand how we got from a uniform primordial soup to all the galaxies uh, with all their diverse properties we see today, we have to understand not only the galaxies, but the black holes. And that's what we're interested in doing, is finding these black holes in the high energy x-ray and looking. That tells us that because we're seeing high energy x-rays, they're growing, matter's falling on, they're getting bigger. And uh, we want to then look at the properties of the associated galaxies and see uh, how they're related over cosmic time. So that's why we care. And the other thing we know is that if you look up in the sky and you had x-ray eyes and you asked where would it glow uh, the brightest, it would be in the high energy x-ray band, 30 kiloelectron volts well above that magic 10 keV uh, dividing line I told you about. That's where most of the uh, emission from bl growing black holes is. And this is the best image we have of the extragalactic sky in the high energy x-ray. Okay, there's no resolved source here, not one. But this is not uh, background from particles, it's background from the glow of black holes. So it's like trying to read uh, a book without your glasses on. You know that there's a story there. You know there's text, but you can't make out the letters. And after we take New Star and survey a region of the extragalactic sky, this is what we'll see. We'll be able to resolve these black holes. We'll be able to read the majority of the text, which will tell us about uh, the history of black hole growth, how it's related to galaxies, and the history of the high energy universe. So black holes are, by, uh, are not by far the only objects that New Star aims to study. Um, Supernova explosions and their remnants are also primary targets for us. Okay, so once every 30 to 50 years in our galaxy, a massive star, that means more than 10 or so times the mass of our sun, burns all its nuclear fuel. It collapses, and by processes we actually don't understand and theorists can't model, but we know they happen, uh, the star explodes and spews all the elements that it's, it's created over its lifetime, as well as synthesizing new elements, out into the galaxy. And this is how all the elements, like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, iron, all the things that we know and love here on Earth are created. They're created in these stars, and they're distributed throughout the galaxy uh, by these explosions, and eventually find their, self, their way into planets and into life. Now, uh, what we'd like to understand with New Star is how these uh, stars explode, what, uh, when they burn their fuel, what is the process by which they explode, and also how do they spew energy out into the galaxy? How much do they uh, pump out? How far can it get? And that'll tell us how uh, the, that energy influences the galaxy. So this animation shows you a star which explodes through a supernova explosion. This shell is basically energy and material matter that's getting expelled out into the galaxy. All right. Now the core of the star, has uh, it collapses, and it turns out uh, that it will uh, continue to collapse until it forms either a neutron star or a black hole. So it's for New Star studying this these high energy regions uh, where, where energy is being expelled out into the galaxy, as well as studying the neutron stars or black holes uh, that get get left behind. Uh, these are primary objectives. Now the neutron stars are interesting. Uh, they're so dense that a teaspoonful of a neutron star weighs more than all of the humans on Earth. Right? And they can have uh, magnetic fields that are a quadrillion times the Earth's magnetic field. And fascinating physics goes on in these objects, and New Star can probe that physics. 
And then what we also want to do is by studying the remnant in radioactivity, which no telescope has been able to do before, that'll tell us uh, about the mechanism by which this explosion happened. And I should say, in spite of uh, the ability to use countless hours on the uh, best computers in the world, theorists still can't robustly make the uh, stars explode. And New Star uh, will shed light on, on what is it? Is it asymmetries? Is there some physics going on that we're missing? So let me turn now, uh, after motivating why we wanted to build New Star, let me tell you a little bit about the mission. So as I said, New Star will be the first uh, high energy X-ray telescope that can focus, all right? The telescopes that we've had before look like this uh, instrument over here, all right? This is a high energy X-ray quote unquote telescope, but it operates on the principle of a pinhole camera. Now you may have made a pinhole camera to look at the uh, solar eclipse, right? Very, pinhole cameras are just fine for looking at things that are very bright, but they're not good for looking at things that are very faint. To look at things that are very faint, you need to build a real telescope. You need to take light and you need to concentrate it from as big a mirror as you can make onto a small spot on a detector. And this is what New Star will do. This shows you uh, a graphic of what New Star actually looks like. There's two high energy X ray lenses there on the left, all right, which focus, uh, bend X ray light, and focus it onto basically digital X ray cameras at the other end. All right? And I'm going to talk about that funny looking structure that uh, connects them as well. But what I want to start by telling you is how. Uh, X-ray lenses or X-ray mirrors work, because this was a key development that we had uh, to make in order to uh, be able to build New Star. Now, as I said, there have been uh, focusing X-ray telescopes that work at low energy X-ray. So I'm going to start there and tell you how we had to advance this technology to make it work at high energies. So first, how do X-ray uh, mirrors work at all. Well, x-rays, unlike visible light, can't reflect off of surfaces at any angle. So think of a, a mirror, right? You can make a flat mirror and reflect light. You can make a parabolic mirror. The light reflects basically at any angle, all right? However, uh, x-rays will only reflect off of surfaces at extremely glancing angles, all right? So it's like skipping a rock off the surface of the water. All right, it has to come in at a very glancing angle to reflect. And this makes the design of X-ray mirrors very different from the design of optical mirrors. All right, because if you think about it, if I have a surface and I can only reflect uh, radiation that comes in nearly parallel to that surface, all right, I'm not going to be able to intercept a lot of uh, the light. Right? Uh, so. What I have to do is put many surfaces uh, together. And these surfaces look like this. They look sort of like uh, coffee cans or Russian dolls nested inside one another. And each one of these surfaces reflects a little bit of the x-ray beam and brings it to the focus on a, a camera some distance away. And this is called a grazing incident reflection. Now, what makes it tough? is that you have to have a lot of uh, finely figured, highly reflective surface area, right? If you think about it, uh, the collecting area is not sort of, uh, the surface area of optic you need is all of those uh, nested insides of all of those nested reflectors, right? As opposed to an optical telescope where uh, it would just be sort of a cross section perpendicular to those surfaces, right? So what do we have to do to extend uh, these X-ray telescopes to high energies? Well, it turns out that that angle for which you can get reflection gets smaller and smaller as the energy of the X-ray gets higher. All right? 
So what that effectively means is that you need uh, more and more uh, shells or mirrors that are at more and more glancing angles. All right? And uh, so let's look at a low energy X-ray telescope like NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory, okay, that's shown on the left. Chandra has four nested mirror shells, and those mirror shells are one centimeter thick, okay? And Chandra cost, I think in today's dollars, just over $2 billion, okay? So New Star, on the other hand, we had need uh, 133 nested shells, okay, instead of four, to not block all of the aperture, we could only make those shells not a centimeter thick, but more like 100 microns or, or something like the thickness of your fingernail, all right? And, by the way, the uh, total end cost, including rocket and all of the science and the telescope and everything uh, for New Star was 160 million, okay? So this, this was the challenge, all right? And uh, how did we do it? Well, what we hit upon to make the optics, okay, we searched far and wide. We came up with all sorts of crazy ideas, like aluminum foil, believe it or not. We thought rolling aluminum foil and then trying to make the inside surface really smooth, all right? Uh, we tried all kinds of glass, thin glass, and it turns out that most glass won't work, but we found a type of glass that's used on flat panel displays, like on laptops. And it turns out this is incredibly smooth at the scale of an atom. That's what we needed uh, for New Star. You could buy it relatively inexpensively uh, in pretty much any thickness. And so what we did is we started out with this glass, and basically to make those reflective surfaces, we take the glass, put it over a mandrel, that's what this thing right there, we call that a mandrel. We set the glass on top, we put it in an oven, and we melt it. And it, it takes the form of the mandrel, then we pop it off, okay? And that's the way we make these highly smooth reflective surfaces, all right? Now what we have to do then is put these segments together into a, a telescope. And the way we did that is to take, basically, we start out with uh, a core, and we glue pencil lead, or it's not exactly pencil lead, but it's graphite, very similar to pencil lead, uh, which are these things right here. So we start here, all right? We glue a piece of graphite down, and then we put one of these shells on top with glue, and we wait for the glue to dry, all right? And then we put another spacer down, and we machine it, and then we put some glue on, and then we stick the shell down, and, you know, wearing ma out many graduate students later, we end up with <laughs> an optic, okay? So, so this is basically how we built the new star optics. Now, that's not the end of the story, okay? So uh, the other thing, it turns out that uh, just having these very glancing angles isn't quite enough. We also have to apply reflective coatings. So, you know, your uh, glasses have anti-reflective coatings that are thin films, alternating uh, films that are finely tuned uh, to be anti-reflective. Well, we wanted to build uh, similar kinds of films to put on the surface of those optics, all right, to make them reflective. And so it's the same principle, it's the principle of uh, constructive interference, the same thing that when you look at a soap bubble, bubble, you see enhanced colors, and the color you see depends on the thickness of the film, okay? Well, so we wanted to make uh, these reflective coatings reflect a whole wide spectrum or a whole rainbow of X-ray colors. So we had to have films, and about 200 of them, on the surface of each one of those 133 shells, all right, that were alternating thin films. In our case, we used a combination alternating tungsten and silicon and then platinum and carbon. But the amazing thing is these films, the uh, thickness of an individual film is only a few atoms, 
all right? So like five angstroms, all right? So you have to lay these films down atom by atom, and they have to be very smooth. The, the uh, uh, contrast between one film and the next has to be very sharp, okay? So that took a while to figure out, but we did figure out how to do it. And if, then built a chamber to coat these in uh, Denmark. And so kind of interesting part of how New Star was built is we made the glasses, the, the glass in Maryland. We shipped it to New York, to Columbia University, where uh, <clears throat> it was measured. Then we shipped it to Denmark to coat it, then back to Columbia to put it in the optic. And anyway, it was an interesting process, including uh, a lot of FedEx bills. But at any rate, uh, we did succeed. And uh, that's the story behind the development of the optics. Now, the other part of the story, and, and this is the part that took place in my labs in uh, the basement of, of Cahill, is making the digital camera. Okay, digital cameras that were used on the Chandra mission are made of silicon, all right, which is fine, it's fine material, uh, very good crystalline properties, but it's not very good at stopping X-ray, high energy X-rays. High energy X-rays will just go straight through uh, the detectors that were used by Chandra. So, and, um, so we needed some kind of digital film that was good. So if you see uh, all that plot on the right shows you is what fraction of the X-rays you would stop of a certain energy. And remember, we want New Star to work from here to here, and we'd be throwing away a lot of those x-rays by letting them go right through the detector, x-rays that were so painfully built mirrors to reflect. So we had to come up with a new material. And so we adopted a material called cadmium zinc telluride. I uh, won't say anything about that, except that it's good at stopping high energy x-rays. But then we had to develop the electronics to read it out. And uh, this shows you the new star digital camera. Each one of these chips has 1,024 pixels, all right? Um, and there's four of them. And all I want to point out is each one of those pixels, uh, to read out the, the x-rays, to be able to detect them as sensitively as we wanted to, we had to have each one of those pixels have an awful lot of circuitry. So I don't want probably uh, won't make too much of that diagram on the right, except it's a lot of circuitry, and we needed to shrink all that circuitry down into an area half a millimeter by half a millimeter, which is the size of one of our pixels. And so we adopted the very large-scale integrated circuit technology pioneered by Carver Mead's lab here at Caltech to build these digital cameras. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Now let's get to uh, how we managed to pack uh, this telescope into a small rocket, all right? Now the thing about these uh, grazing incidents or glancing incident optics, right, is they reflect and get very slightly deflected off the surface. So it, they come to a focus uh, a very long distance away. In our case, 10 meters, or the length of a school bus, all right? So we needed the distance between the optics and the digital film to be 10 meters, okay? But NASA said, hey, you're a small mission. We're, you got to launch on a rocket that's this big, okay? And the rocket, by the way, has to fit underneath the belly of an L-1011 aircraft to be launched, all right? So, how are we going to take something that basically started at, starts out needing to be the height of a, a sort of relatively tall basketball player and end up the length of a school bus? Well, it turned out JPL knew how to do this. They had worked with a company on a deployable structure that unfolded uh, for a shuttle mission, in fact. And that was pretty hard, because not only did it have to unfold, it had to fold back to get the astronauts back. So, so we adopted this structure that, that's that uh, tinker toy looking thing uh, to use for New Star. So this is what New Star uh, looked like when, it was all, when it's all put together in its compact form, all right, stowed. Uh, you can see two 
uh, X-ray optics here at the top. The digital uh, cameras are buried way down here. Solar array uh, wrapped around the uh, experiment. And so this is what it looked like just before uh, we shipped it from where it was integrated in Virginia to uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base. Okay. And this shows you, so that's how big it started out. This shows you in an animation how this mast unfolds. Okay, so it's all stowed away, folded inside this canister. Okay, and then you see this structure unlocks piece by piece, 56 of these pieces locks into place into a stiff structure that will hold the optics at the requisite distance from the um, digital uh, film. So this uh, deployable mast then was another piece of key technology that we had to adapt uh, to make New Star work. So there you can see the two X-ray lenses. Okay, so the X-ray light would come in this way, get deflected, and be imaged onto the detectors here. And this uh, is that solar array that started out wrapped around the the uh, experiment. Okay, so now let's talk about the launch itself. And what, so now I'm just going to take you through a time sequence of what's happened uh, since launch and uh, where we are now. Okay, so the launch was June 13th of this year from the Reagan test site on the Kwajalein Atoll in the South Pacific. And I'll tell you in a minute why uh, we went to the trouble of launching from Kwajalein. And I'll tell you, even though it's the South Pacific, it's not a terribly nice place, and it wasn't so that we could have a junket to the South Pacific. Uh, so let me just uh, tell you what happened to New Star. I showed you a picture of what it looked like uh, at, where it was put together at our, our spacecraft contractors in Virginia. It then got shipped to Vandenberg Air Force Base, all right, and stowed inside what we call a fairing or a nose cone of a rocket there. And so you can see the two X-ray telescopes. That square dark thing is a star camera, as it turns out, and then that uh, circular thing on the bottom is the canister where the mast is, all right? So it all got stowed in there. It got put under the belly of an aircraft at Vandenberg, took off from Vandenberg there on the right, had to stop off for refueling in Hawaii, landed in Kwajalein uh, for the launch. And so there it is at Kwajalein, and that's what sunset at Kwajalein looks like. So the launch itself, let's talk about how the launch works. So uh, what happens is the rocket drops for five seconds from underneath the aircraft. It's a three-stage rocket. So the first stage here burns, second stage uh, now burns, okay? Uh, the fairing opens, and then uh, the final stage maneuvers it and puts it into orbit uh, in the uh, way that we want. Okay, so that's how the launch works. Why did we bother to go to Kwajalein? Well, the reason we bothered to go to Kwajalein is the following. We wanted to go around very close to the equator, okay? And if you try to launch from, say, Vandenberg, and get some satellite uh, into orbit around the equator, it takes a tremendous amount of extra rocket fuel, okay, and a huge rocket. So by flying to the equator and starting out taking off from there, we could get into an orbit uh, right over, uh, very close to the equator. And the reason we wanted to do that is on the bottom, those uh, red and green contours, show you what's called the South Atlantic anom Anomaly, which is a region of trapped particles that would create noise and background in, in the detectors. So, so that's why we uh, took the trouble to fly to Kwajalein. So here's launch day 
uh, I was at the Mission Ops Center in Berkeley, but this is Hamid Min Auditorium in Caltech, and I'll say a large number of graduate students, postdocs, uh, young engineers, undergraduate summer research fellows worked on New Star, and they all gathered in the auditorium to watch the launch. It's kind of amazing given that there wasn't actually all that much to see. The reason being, we launched at night. That was good commentary. Uh, but uh, the, because of how we wanted to come out uh, into the sunlight a certain time after launch, we had to launch at night. So all we could see, really, was this. There was a camera underneath the air, uh, belly of the airplane uh, watching the rocket drop and then take off. Okay, and then after that, all we saw was a bunch of telemetry. But I'll tell you the worst part about this, okay, was there's a delay in the transmission of the, the images. So the, the audio said, Pegasus is dropped and away. And we saw it, it's like, no, it's not. It's still attached to the... So like, I hope they know what they're talking about. But in fact, it did uh, cleanly separate. It was a picture-perfect launch. Everything worked great. We got into the orbit we wanted. And then here's our version of the seven minutes of terror. Okay. <laughs> now, in our case, this happened nine days after launch. All right. And it wasn't seven minutes. It was 24.3 minutes. Okay, and this was the mast unfolding. So this is a picture. We were all at Berkeley, and what could we see? We didn't have a camera, but every time one of these bays clicked and unfolded, we would see a little pulse on that screen right there. So we had people in many, looking at many different workstations, counting to 56, okay? And we had a little more information than that. But it worked perfectly. And it's amazing, because even though it's not 76 pyrotechnics or whatever, it is you know, tens of thousands of moving parts, a motor that was built uh, basically in the basement of a university lab, and a, uh, an extendable structure that could never be fully tested on the ground. We never deployed this mast with the optics on, with the whole thing through the flight system on the ground. Why not? It was just too dangerous and expensive because there's no gravity in space, but if we had wanted to do this, we would have had to suspend balance gravity, you know, suspend the optics perfectly, not push anything, because if we pushed it even slightly, it would break. Just too risky. So this was... Uh, like landing on Mars, not quite, not quite as hard, but still something we could never test, and we were very happy that it worked perfectly. Now, the other thing I want to point out is that no astronomical telescope has ever used an extended structure like this, okay? And I'll tell you what these plots mean in a minute, but let me describe them first. So, in order to make images, we have to know exactly what the alignment of those optics are relative to the digital camera to the level of 100 microns, which again is about the thickness of your, of your fingernail, okay? Now, that mast, okay, you gotta admit, it looks like a slinky, right? It actually acts like a slinky, okay? It moves around. That we just could not build it stiff enough or thermally stable enough not to have it move uh, the optics relative to the detectors as we go around in and out of uh, shadow of the Earth. So what we had to do is rely on the fact that we're counting x-rays, and we can measure uh, when, for each x-ray we detect, we measure the instantaneous alignment of our system and take that alignment out on the ground. And the way we do that is we take two lasers and we shine them from the optics onto the focal plane, all right? And what this shows you, 
the, are those wacky looking tracks. That's a laser moving around over the course of an orbit. So you just take the green tracks. That was one particular solar illumination angle, and this is from flight. Those lasers are moving around because the slinky's going like this, right? We measure that and we take it out. So this all had to work. It had to be perfectly aligned, another thing we could never really test on the ground. We did have a little adjustment mechanism built in, which we used on the 10th day after launch to get things just right. And then we just watched those tracks and we subtract them out on the ground. That all worked great. So now let me uh, get to what, so after we deployed that mast and adjusted it all and started measuring its uh, deflections on orbit, then it was time to look at our first x-ray source. And our, the first x-ray source we looked at actually was a black hole. It's not one of these supermassive black holes at the center of a galaxy, but uh, it's a black hole that's about uh, 15 times the mass of our sun that's left over from one of those supernova explosions that happened millions of years ago. And this is a source called Cygnus X1. Now, the main characteristics we wanted for this source is we wanted it to be really bright. Because the other thing, we, we, we had to kind of hunt around a little bit to find it. And we had a bunch of press and JPL people wanting to tweet to the world and all of this. And so we said, we better choose a target that we just can't miss, no matter what. <laughs> okay. So, so we chose this target called Cygnus X1. And, and it, so here's the black hole. This is an artist's conception. Okay, we can't image this. It just looks like a point source to us because this is all happening on a tiny scale. But, but by studying the X-ray emission, we can tell that what's happening is material is coming off of, it's in a binary. Material's coming off a star and falling into an accretion disk, similar to those disks that are around the supermassive black holes, but just smaller. Uh, and then heating up and emitting very high energy x-rays and actually spewing relativistic particles out in a huge jet. Cool. So this was our first light source. Here's our first light image. So this is, again, a source in our galaxy in the constellation Cygnus, this black hole. And on the top, that shows you an image of Cygnus X1 made with one of those pinhole cameras. Okay, it's not really, an, it looks like a point source, but if you look at the dotted uh, square, okay, and you expand it out, this is what New Star sees. Okay, that's a very blurry just because of the bad resolution of the, telescope, the previous telescope. So that square expands out to this, and here's New Star's pinpointing of that X-ray source. So that just tells you the difference in the quality of the images we can now make of the high energy X-ray sky. So that was our first light. Now let me tell you what we've been doing since. So again, we've only had a few weeks of observations, but we've already been able to do some great science, and we haven't finished interpreting it yet. But one of the first things we looked at was the heart of our own Milky Way. Now, our Milky Way, as I mentioned before, has a massive black hole, four million times the mass of the, black, uh, of the sun at its center. That black hole is called Sagittarius A star. Okay. Now, the weird thing about Sagittarius A star is it's very dim. It's very dim in all wavelengths, x-rays, optical, infrared. So it's not eating much matter. And the theory for why it's not eating much matter is that in the past there have been events that have uh, spewed large amounts of energy uh, into the region around the center of the galaxy and basically <laughs> blown away the material that could otherwise fall on and make it grow. Uh, and so one thing that New Star will do is here's an image we made of the region around Sagittarius A star. That arrow shows you where it is, okay? And all of this fuzz here is very hot gas. It's millions, 100 million degree gas. And for the very first time, we can image it. Never before been imaged in the high energy X-ray and see where is this gas and is it plausible that that's what's stopping our black hole, central black hole from feeding, okay? Uh, another amazing thing, though, is that it's the 
Sag star uh, is usually very quiet, but about once a day it, it burps. It burps in infrared, x-ray, and high energy, well, we think high energy x-ray, okay? And it's been a big mystery what makes these flares or these, these hiccups of, of emission. And one recent theory is, uh, in fact, that um, there are hundreds of trillions of asteroids and comets circling, hovering around uh, the Milky Way black hole. And every once in a while, one of these falls on, gets ripped apart, and creates a flare. Okay? So uh, if confirmed, then it would mean that, that uh, tidal forces are stripping comets and, uh, and asteroids out of stars that are uh, going around the center of the galaxy. So to test this theory, <clears throat> New Star teamed up with the Chandra X-ray Observatory and with the Keck telescopes very early on uh, in our science uh, phase to stare at Sagittarius A star. And this, is the two, this was actually a picture taken while New Star was observing Sagittarius A star. It was a picture taken by the Subaru telescope operator. So Subaru is another telescope that's on uh, the top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii along with uh, the Keck telescopes. And they were using uh, laser guide stars pointed up at the atmosphere to make the atmosphere uh, glow like a star so that then they can use that scintillation to take out the twinkling of the light from the uh, Milky Way black hole, okay, at the same time that New Star was looking, all right. And as it turns out, we had a great night. It was really, really uh, active. The, the center of the galaxy was really, really active. And if we, if we, we've already extracted the X-rays coming from that region, and we can see them varying all over the place. And by piecing this together with the low energy X-rays and the uh, Keck data, we should be able to tell whether this asteroid theory is is correct. So that's one of the first things we did. Uh, another thing we just recently did was look at a famous 300-year-old supernova remnant called Cassiopeia A. And uh, this shows you a composite image of the remnant in uh, infrared and low energy x-rays. Here's our image. It's only a little bit of data. We don't have uh, the sharpness that an infrared telescope has, but this is the first time we've been, ever been able to see the distribution of high energy x-rays in this remnant. Previous telescopes would just see this as one point, like a star, okay? Here we have many, many, you can see many, many resolution elements across. We can split one of these out into uh, colors, colors of the X-ray rainbow, and uh, study uh, where the energy uh, is being pumped out in that remnant. Uh, so another thing we've done is looked at some nearby galaxies and looked for uh, new black holes, new black holes that are uh, the type that result from a supernova explosion. And in particular, uh, to study some of these that are really, really bright for reasons we can't explain. Okay, so if you look at a nearby galaxy and you pinpoint X-ray uh, sources and measure their brightness, occasionally you find one that's so bright we have no, no way to make it glow that brightly through processes we understand. Two possible explanations. There are processes we don't understand. That's quite possible. Or these are not uh, black holes that resulted from the explosion of a single star, but they're black holes that are 500 to 1,000 times the mass of the sun that form through processes that, well, we don't understand. So <laughs> either way, it's a, it's a very interesting mystery. And we looked at, uh, we've already looked at some of these sources. Uh, partnering with low energy X-ray telescopes. And again, by putting all the colors of the X-ray uh, rainbow together, we can actually tell whether the uh, models for how the stuff, the material is uh, falling on and creating X-rays are correct, or could there be new processes uh, going on here. 
Now, one of the next things that we'll do is make a map of a much larger region around uh, the center of the galaxy, of the Milky Way. So that Sagittarius A star region I showed you is just one little uh, region there. And here we'll be trying to find uh, the rem those compact remnants, the neutron stars, uh, the black holes that end up, uh, that get remain after uh, stars explode. On the top, that shows you the best map we have today of this region. We can see about six sources that we can resolve. Here's what we expect New Star to see, to be able to discover and study hundreds more of these, uh, what we call compact objects, neutron stars and black holes, basically because it's a fossil record of how stars have died throughout the history of the galaxy, which we can study. And finally, uh, we're going to look at the sun, which may seem weird to you. Uh, but in fact, it's not something that I ever thought when I proposed to NASA that we would look at. But after we started building New Star, a bunch of solar uh, physicists came and said, look, if you guys can point at the sun, even just for a day, you can answer a long-standing mystery about what heats the tenuous atmosphere of the sun. Because if we're right, and New Star is so sensitive it should, can, can point at the sun, it does, ought to see a little flare, tiny little flare, once a minute that is a signal of energy being dumped out into the solar uh, atmosphere. Because we, we really don't have a good understanding of why this very hot atmosphere sits on something that's much colder. Seems to defy, you know, laws of thermodynamics. So we will look at the sun, but at the end of our primary two-year mission phase, just in case, even though there shouldn't be any problem. Uh, so I just wanted to end by showing you uh, some of the team. There's a few, uh, a couple students missing from this picture, but small team of dedicated people uh, at Caltech worked very hard to build all the instrument electronics and the uh, detectors and calibrate them and get New Star into orbit. And they're all poring over these images now, uh, trying to figure out what they mean. So I think I will end with that. So I've just been, um, I was asked to remind you that if, if you have questions, if you could just use a microphone so they can uh, record them for posterity. Yes, um, Mark Similino, class of 76. Uh, it occurred to me, I work with optics a lot, that probably your reflection off of the actual coating is polarized. Is that correct? Did, did you getting TE enhanced reflection or something like that? Um, actually, it turns out that because of the way uh, those uh, multi-layer, the uh, reflective coatings work, uh, that there's a whole lot of layers of them of different thicknesses, uh, that the ultimate emission doesn't end up being polarized. But you're absolutely right. If we had alternating layers that were all the same thickness uh, at the right angle, you would, you would get polarization of the beam. But it just the detail of the design, it doesn't end up being that polarized. Thank you. Yep. Uh, will you be able to uh, detect Hawking radiation and make him really happy? Uh, <laughs> no, I can uh, almost... Lots of unexpected things we'll find, but I, I can almost guarantee you that it won't be Hawking radiation. So, <laughs> unfortunately, yeah. But I should—I could tell you a story about Cygnus X1, though, which I didn't actually know until the other day. That apparently Hawking uh, lost a bet. He bet that it wasn't a black hole because it's been around sort of since the 70s. The idea that it could be a black hole since the very first X-ray missions, and he bet that was wrong. And now we, we pr have pretty good proof that it's a black hole. So we did, you know, 
You showed the, the um, relationship between the mass of the black hole in the center of a galaxy and the surrounding visible stars. How is the mass of a black hole estimated? Uh, excellent question. So uh, there's several different techniques. If, um, so if we have a black hole that's close enough, like say uh, at the center of the galaxy, we can actually watch the trajectories of stars as they go by. That's been done uh, with infrared uh, telescopes. And, and that's a very direct, uh, accurate measurement of the uh, mass of the black hole. <clears throat> Other ways uh, in, uh, for black holes that are further away, uh, we use models of the uh, radiation, the relationship between the amount of radiation that comes off and the mass to uh, determine the mass. So there's both direct and indirect techniques that we use depending on how far away uh, the black hole is. Okay. Okay, so the question was how we got the idea. How did you got it? Oh, okay. Well, so actually, um, when I was a graduate student, I spent many years uh, laboriously building one of those pinhole cameras to launch on a balloon experiment. And it was a lot of fun, but ultimately, when we launched it, I realized all of the exciting uh, science potentially that we can do in this. Uh, energy band, this telescope's just not sensitive, and there's no way that we can scale it. I can think of scaling it in a way that will make it sensitive enough. And it was quite clear, therefore, that the next step was to figure out how to make a lens. And uh, so it was basically going around, uh, gathering, a, you know, I worked with experts that I sort of recruited from around the world in optics and coatings and uh, to, we actually built a balloon version of this uh, instrument that d didn't have an extendable mast, but that we could demonstrate to NASA that it worked. And then, you know, I actually thought we were kind of crazy to waste our time writing a proposal because I thought that nobody would believe that on one of these small platforms you could do something this crazy. This is probably the most complicated small explorer mission ever flown with one of these extendable masts. But NASA took a risk. They decided to, you know, to, to give it a shot. They told us, if you fail, we'll cancel you. So we were highly motivated. <laughs> and, and it worked. And, it, and you know, it, it, I have to credit a large team of very, very dedicated people uh, around the world, but particularly, you know, my group and the JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, did a great job. Uh, is New Star in low Earth orbit, and how long do you expect it to stay up? Okay, good question. Yes, it is in low Earth orbit. It's uh, at an altitude of 635 kilometers above, above the Earth. And at that altitude, basically what limits our lifetime is just drag. And those estimates are a little uncertain, but, but best guess is around 10 years. So that's great. So we have a two-year prime mission life, then we just have to convince NASA we're still doing great science, and we could go for 10 years. Do you see any way that this could shed some light on dark matter? Uh, good question. There is a chance that this can uh, shed some light on dark matter uh, in one of two ways. Uh, and I would say they're both a bit of a long shot, but probably our only chance at a Nobel Prize. Uh, one is actually surprisingly by looking at the sun, OK? So there's a model for dark matter uh, where the particles are something called axions. And there's a mechanism by which axions can be converted via a magnetic field into x-rays, OK? And so there's actually experiments uh, at CERN that are using the sun to try to actually convert 
using a strong magnet magnetic field, uh, convert them into x-rays on, on, on the Earth. But we can use the sun's magnetic field and look at the sun and look if this model is true, there should be more x-rays coming uh, from the center of the sun than from the uh, edge of the sun uh, because of the amount of magnetic field you have to go through. And as the sun's magnetic field changes, we ought to see this x-ray emission change. Okay, so we can test uh, this axion model. And, rule, and even if we don't see anything, we can rule out some of the possible phase space. Uh, and then the other um, uh, way we might indirectly uh, detect dark matter is through other mechanisms, uh, dark matter can uh, decay and uh, create x-rays. And this would be WIMP, uh, the model where the dark matter is WIMPs, uh, which is weakly interactive massive particles. And by looking at some nearby uh, galaxies where there's high densities of dark matter and, and searching again for the, these decays, uh, we might be able to, to say something. That's a challenging observation because you have to convince yourself that the x-rays aren't coming from some astrophysical, you know, from hot gas or some other source. But yes, in fact, we have a shot at, a shot at it. <clears throat> you mentioned uh, the color of the x-ray spectrum. How does your de detector measure the energy of the x-ray photons? Is each photon characterized or? Yeah, that's another great question. Uh, in fact, what we do is uh, the x-rays, when they interact with the detector, uh, they create a pulse of electrons, which is proportional, the number of electrons that created is proportional to the energy of the x-ray. We collect those uh, electrons, and because of all that circuitry I showed you, uh, that a large amount of circuitry enables us to measure the amount of that electron signal quite accurately and therefore measure the X-ray energy. And by the way, those detectors are better by about a factor of seven than any other uh, imaging high-energy X-ray detector at measuring the X-ray energy. Um, uh, this is out of my field, so uh, but black to me means you can't see it in the visible. So a black hole, uh, photons in the visible are a couple EV. Is there some wavelength or some energy, like you're talking 50 kV, where they get out of the black hole? Okay, great. Uh, so black holes are actually black, except for the uh, aforementioned Hawking radiation, which we're not actually sure how that, what kind of radiation that is. Uh, but so if you're within a certain distance called the event horizon, okay, which is a, a, a region that's, that's fairly small uh, and depends on the mass of the black hole, nothing, no visible light, no x-rays, nothing gets out. So we're not actually seeing the black hole itself. What we're seeing uh, is we're seeing all the matter that gets attracted by the gravity of the black hole. That matter falls on, it, it uh, forms into a disk, and it heats up. And so the, that uh, gravitational potential gets turned into heat, as it, and the material gets hotter and hotter and hotter the closer it gets to the black hole, so that when you're just a, a few times the distance of the event horizon from the black hole, that material is so hot, it glows in the x-rays, all right? But then once it falls beyond the event horizon, it just makes the mass of the black hole larger. We lose all information about it. We no longer see it. Uh, so does that make sense? So we're not actually seeing the black hole. We're seeing the stuff falling onto the black hole. Uh, yeah, will, will New Star be able to study pulsars or work on that neutron star equation of state stuff that people are worried about? Yeah, uh, good question. Absolutely. And um, so let me start first by saying what interesting will do for pulsars and neutron stars. Uh, what I think is the most interesting. Um, so there are, there's a class of neutron stars. And remember, the neutron stars are what are left over from the core of a massive star, right? It just 
it collapses, the uh, electrons and nuclei get merged together. And it's basically just like one giant nucleus, okay? Really uh, dense. And um, some of these have intense magnetic fields. So, you know, quadrillion times the magnetic field of the Earth. And for reasons that are not understood, we know for a few of the brightest ones that we've been able to study with the less sensitive telescopes that we have, uh, they emit high energy X-ray radiation. That was completely unexpected. And, and the mechanism, there's m many exotic mechanisms proposed for, for why this is. We'll be able to actually, for the first time, study this radiation uh, in a significant number of these highly magnetized neutron stars to try to understand what's, what's creating it. And also, as you, as you mentioned, it's a big goal to try to understand the, basically, pressure density relationship in a neutron star, because there's all sorts of exotic states of matter that could, could come to play. And what, on one way, what you'd really like to do is measure the mass and the radius of the neutron star. That's tough to do, and new star won't be able to do that uh, directly, but we can measure masses of neutron stars by using optical telescopes to measure the orbits, uh, their orbits around the companion, and then using X-ray pulsations so we can get both the orbit of the star and the orbit of the neutron star in a binary, and, and therefore uh, say what, what the mass of the neutron star is. And, and once you get up above a certain mass, which is you know, a couple times the mass of the sun, then it turns out that rules out many of the possibilities for the equation of state. Well, would you just talk about the maximum count rates, the time resolution, the spectral resolution, and the saturation properties of your detector? Sure. So the detectors are optimized for, I, you may have an application in mind. <laughs> These were, I should say, very specifically designed for astronomy. Uh, the maximum count rate we can handle is 400 counts per second. However, that's largely, that's not limited so much by the intrinsic property of the detector, but by the processor we're using to, to read it out. So we could improve that by a factor of a few with a better pro processor. The time resolution is about a, a microsecond. And the energy resolution uh, at the low energy end is about uh, 400 electron volts. And uh, at h higher energies, it's about uh, 900 electron volts. And the dif difference just has to do with um, some issues of non-uniform charge collection in the detector. So, so if you're wanting to use it for medical imaging or you know, other, other things, we'll probably have to get the count rate up for you by a factor of 10. Yes, in fact, so the question was, are we going to be connected to any of the uh, optical telescopes that are surveying the sky all the time looking for new supernovae? And absolutely. One of the things that would be fantastic is, you know, we are overdue for a supernova in the Milky Way. And so we are poised to look, uh, to be able to reorient and look very quickly. But we're also very interested in all sorts of uh, the exotic supernovae that the Palomar Transient Factory is discovering. And we have a close relationship with them that they notify us anytime there's, there's an object of interest. And in particular, you know, we've had a couple of very nearby supernova type 1As, which are not, uh, so if you don't know what those are, that's not when the, a massive star collapses, but we think it's actually a thermonuclear detonation of a white dwarf. Why it happens, we're not quite sure. But these are being used. You may have heard about um, dark energy and that supernova, the Nobel Prize was won uh, by uh, Adam Reese and Saul Perlmutter recently because they were able to use these objects to measure as standard candles to basically map out um, uh, the uh, basically metric of the universe and uh, show that it, the universe is 
expanding at an accelerated rate. So what we're interested in, not interested in these, not because of that, but because even though they're being used for precision cosmology, we still don't really understand the explosions at all. And if we can find a nearby one and get New Star on there quick, quickly, we can actually make significant inroads in, in understanding the detonation itself. So we're, unfortunately, one of the nearest uh, ones in decades happened right before launch. It was just a little unfortunate. But I keep reminding, you know, I have to keep reminding my students that such events are not correlated. It's like I try to teach my five-year-old that if you flip a coin just because you got heads last time, it doesn't mean that you're going to get tails next time. So I keep saying, we still have the same chance as we've always had in a mission life to get, get a nearby one. So yes, we're very interested in uh, the, the, the basically general supernova phenomenon. I'd always thought that the center of galaxies, when they shine really bright, that they were the birthplace of stars. If you're saying that the center of every galaxy is a black hole, do we not have nurseries? Great question. OK. Uh, what we're talking about is different physical scales. So uh, when you see you know, one of those Hubble images, uh, you're seeing stars shine. And there are star clusters very near the center of the galaxy. But the black hole is, uh, the, that's at the very uh, you know, gravitational center of the galaxy. Its event, uh, typical event horizon you know, is only the size of the inner solar system. Okay, So there is a little black spot in the middle of our galaxy, but it's only the size of the inner solar system, and you can't see that with an optical telescope. But you do see you know, star clusters and stellar nurseries on larger scales. You've talked about black holes mostly in our galaxy, uh, maybe in nearby galaxies. Are there deeper universe questions that you can ask with New Star, um, objects that are much further away in the deep universe? Yeah, so it, it turns out, by and large, uh, that the black holes uh, that we will see are not in the very distant universe. There are some interesting uh, individual objects that are in the quite uh, distant universe. Uh, so we have a handful of those that we'll specifically target uh, to look at. But by and large, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at, um, you know, the universe at, you know, out to when it was about, oh, you know, 20% of its present age. So if, if you know about redshift, it's redshifts of a few. That'll be the next project, is to build an even bigger uh, telescope so we can go <laughs> more distant. Actually, to follow that up, is there a gamma ray analog of this uh, that might be big to be built? Or gamma ray is a different ball of wax? Yeah, so gamma rays are uh, a different ball of wax. Uh, basically, once you get beyond <laughs> maybe one or 200 kilo electron volts. So by the, a gamma rays are sort of M mega electron volts and above. Uh, it's, it becomes in pretty much impossible to reflect just because uh, you start getting gamma rays inter interacting by producing electron-positron pairs. And you, do, you just get totally different physics. But there is a gamma ray telescope called Fermi that uses that production process uh, on orbit now. And in fact, we are partnering with Fermi to look at some very extreme black holes that have uh, jets spewing out of them, uh, spewing out relativistic particles um, on very large scales. So we are teaming with a gamma ray telescope to learn more about those sorts of objects. So I'm curious about what the uh, angular resolution is of the scope, since basically you're using, you know, 133 rings, and you know, compared to an optical telescope, of course, that's almost coarse, in spite of this huge amount of involved in making it. Right. So that's a good question. We don't have the same kind of resolution that you would get uh, for an optical telescope, or even uh, the Chandra Low Energy X-ray Telescope, to get very good. Uh, angular resolution, you have to have incredibly finely figured surfaces, okay? 
And um, so our angular resolution is about 50 arc seconds uh, compared to one arc second for, for Chandra. Uh, but mainly, um, you know, our goal was to get the high sensitivity and just by comparison, the best high-energy X-ray telescopes before us have had angular resolutions of about 12 arc minutes. So, um, so that's a kind of advance. But yeah, I would love to build the next generation with an arc second. It's just that uh, that'll take a lot more technology development to figure out how to make these thin uh, So speaking of, of the glass, next generation, active. where do you see things going 10 or 20 years from now? Um, well, okay, so you, are you asking in astrophysics or a whole or in sort of X-ray astrophysics? Uh, so, you know, I think that um, the next big uh, step is going to be to combine a very sensitive uh, high-energy X-ray telescope with a low-energy X-ray telescope that, that has much better spectral resolution or ability to measure the X-ray energies, uh, that'll open up a whole new regime of, of high energy astrophysics. But that's a big expensive mission and we'll have to see what happens with NASA and <laughs> the future. Uh, it'll be a while. How do you eject off axis X-rays? Is there a collimator? That uh, we actually don't have a pre-collimator. Um, so what he's referring to is that it's a possible to get from further off axis. Sing so our uh, shells, to get a good focus, we reflect the x-rays twice. And you can get x-rays from further off axis that just reflect once and create some stray light. And we, we don't do anything to... Um, to reject that, but it turns out for us scientifically not to be that important, except for a very few isolated, crowded fields. So we didn't, it would have been expensive and, and difficult. So we just deal with the fact that we have a little bit of stray light and we subtract it out. So the, the question was uh, whether we could use NuSTAR to learn anything about the gaseous uh, outer planets, and uh, no, I don't think, um, as far as we know, they, there's no mechanism by which they would emit high-energy x-rays. Oh. So, the, well, what we know is that there's a relationship both between the mass of the black hole and the mass of the galaxy and the uh, rate at which stars are forming on average, okay, not for individual galaxies, but when you average over many galaxies and the rate at which black holes are growing. And the problem is the scale, right, in, in that if you want to have somehow galaxies the mass of the galaxy was assembled through processes of mergers and, uh, and other things. Uh, and that, those processes would have to have affected the mass of the black hole and the mass of the galaxy through this process of, of assembling uh, the building blocks. So it's really, um, it's not, you know, it's not something that you can explain unless you can get, 
there's some process by which the black hole is putting large amounts of energy into the galaxy in certain phases and uh, really um, influencing its assembly. So just on the small scales that you can get, you know, through the accretion process isn't enough, if that makes sense. So it, it has to be, the scale of it is, has to be something to do with the assembly process, uh, the merging process of galaxies and, and black holes over cosmic time. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Going back to her question on the, the gaseous planets, they may not emit X-rays themselves, but if they were to pass in front of a high-energy X-ray source, might you not get an X-ray picture of the planet? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have to admit that's not something I've thought of. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, let's go with this idea for a minute. Um, yeah. If if you could do an occultation measurement of a very bright X-ray source going behind a planet, and you looked at, you could see the absorption characteristics of the atmosphere of that uh, planet as a function of energy. You would see edges due to different elements. But I think the problem would be you'd need a really bright X-ray source, and the probability, there's probably three sources in the sky bright enough, and uh, they would have to cross you know, the ecliptic in just the right way. And so and probably not, not, not likely you could find one that would work. But in principle, you're right, you could. So <laughs> yes, in principle, one could learn something. In principle, I think it's miracle. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there have, uh, yeah, so there have been, um, I'm trying to think, yeah, I mean, it's a sim it's sort of a even harder problem because th those are, you know, much more distant and, you know, you, again, it would be unlikely that you would get a, a one of those passing in front of a bright x-ray source, but. aren't moving, um, would it be feasible at some point to launch a twin of this to basically go to somewhere else, like even around the gaseous planet, in which case it could create its own wow. occultations? You guys really like these gaseous planets. You must, <laughs> you must have heard, you must have been hurt hearing from Ed Stone earlier. Um, <laughs> Well, okay, let me think about that one. I, I guess, I suppose if you could put one in orbit uh, around a gaseous planet, and you could, you could walk, then you could point anywhere, and you could see the occultation signature. Uh, yep. <laughs> but I'm, I'm kind of guessing there are probably easier ways to do that measurement. <laughs> Okay, so I said there's two more minutes, so I guess that's time for one more question, unless you're ready for a beer. <laughs> Anything useful coming from X-rays from the Earth? Uh, X oh, X-rays from the Earth. <laughs> well, okay, so X-rays, actually that's kind of an interesting question. Uh, not that New Star will see, but very wide field, X-ray instruments do see lightning from the Earth, uh, which a lot of people get excited about. I don't know much about it myself, but apparently by watching the X-rays from lightning storms in the upper atmosphere from using orbiting uh, satellites, you can say something about the, part, the way particles get accelerated in, in lightning. So, but we don't have a wide enough field of view to do that particular measurement. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay, yeah, the Earth is too... So one of the reasons that we have to get above the atmosphere is it, 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 it's opaque, so, yep.
Okay, All thank right. you. Thanks a lot. A great questions, by the way. I can tell you're Caltech alums. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, along that line, uh, to me, that was an interesting presentation, uh, another risk taken with uh, potential high reward, and some great alumni questions to make a really interesting event. So that, that, that was neat.